Hello, and welcome back to Short Spotlight, the series where we talk about Disney animated short films. Old and new, obscure and famous, big and small. There's a lot of arguments about what was the golden age for Disney animated short films. You might say the early 2000s with all the classic Pixar animated shorts. You could argue that we're in one right now with Spark Shorts and Short Circuit series on Disney+. Plus. But if you ask me, I'd single out the 1940s as a high point for this medium of Disney storytelling. The animated films of the decade all consisted of short films put into one feature, to the point where it's often referred to as the package era, and many of them are just as iconic as the traditional animated shorts. And by far, one of the most iconic is The Wind in the Willows. The Wind in the Willows started as one half of a feature, but has been repackaged as a standalone short on several occasions. And for good reason, it's one of the funniest and most entertaining films Disney has ever produced. However, with its more well-known B-side and derivatives, I feel like the original cartoon has been overshadowed and forgotten by casual Disney fans. So we'll be reevaluating it and showing why it might deserve a second look. <laughs> Our story begins in the late 1930s. The Disney studio was riding high with the success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. People forget this, but many at the time thought it would fail. A feature-length animated film was absolutely unheard of in Hollywood, and they kinda risked everything for it. However, they proved all of the naysayers wrong. It was widely praised by critics and audiences, and ended up becoming the highest grossing film that year. With all that acclaim and success, one question remained. What comes next? Well, they already had a string of films in production already. Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi were all well underway by the time Snow White hit theaters. But Walt still had his mind on the future and other stories he could turn into animated films. In 1938, one year after the release of the film, he was touring around Europe, acquiring motion picture rights to popular books, including Winnie the Pooh, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan. And one of these stories was Kenneth Graham's 1908 novel, The Wind in the Willows. Two artists at the studios, James Berderito and Campbell Grant, previously pitched the idea to Walt, thinking the stories talking animal characters would be best suited for an animated picture. He initially dismissed it, seeing the story as and I quote, too corny, but he eventually came around to it by the time he was shopping for film rights. Originally intended to be a feature film, production on it began in 1940. Production staff came onto the film having just finished working on Bambi. However, two notable events would change the course of the film's production. The first was the animator strike. Not only was there just less talent working on this film since so many of them were striking, but tensions at the studio were just high in general. Even after it ended, lots of the animators chose to leave. According to some reports, the talent of the studio went from around 12,000 people to less than 700 once the whole thing was over. Naturally, this had an effect on the studio's production output. The other was the advent of the Second World War. Film distribution was effectively cut off from the European market, which was incredibly lucrative. So films just weren't making as much money as they used to. This hit Disney especially hard. It, more than most other studios in Hollywood, really relied on the international market to make a profit. And keep in mind, we're early in 1941. The United States hadn't even entered the war yet. It was a sign of some of the difficulties the studio would face in the coming years. By the end of 1941, Joe Rosenberg, one of Disney's benefactors, wasn't confident in the studio's financial success. Pinocchio was a critical and financial disappointment when it premiered, not doing nearly as well as Snow White. And Fantasia didn't fare any better, not even coming close to recouping its budget at the box office. So he called the producers to the bank's headquarters and gave them an ultimatum. They would lend them $3.5 million, but in return, the studio would only make short films. They could finish the features they already started, but they couldn't make another one until they earned all their money back and repaid their debt. The package era films, where all of them were just a bunch of shorts cobbled together into a feature? This is why that happened. Wind of the Willows was already in production when the ultimatum was given, so they kept moving forward with it. Quite a bit of progress was made on it, keeping fairly close to the Kenneth Graham novel. However, sometime during production, the film was shelved. 
Walt just wasn't happy with the direction it was going in, especially as the feature budgets kept getting slashed. But the production was picked up again by 1946. The original plan was just to expand on what had already been made, but the more they expanded on it, the more the film felt bogged down. So instead, they decided to trim it, giving it a quicker pace. The project was dropped again later that year, but eventually it was finished. However, it wasn't a feature anymore, so they needed to release it with something else to make it one. After failed attempts to pair it with shorts like Bongo or the unproduced Gremlins, they eventually settled on The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Why? Because neither of them were feature length and there was nothing else to pair them up with. Yeah, there's, there's no deeper reason than that. The film was eventually titled The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad and released in 1949 to generally positive reviews. Wind in the Willows in particular soaked up most of the praise. Life magazine wrote, Disney's film leaves out all the poetry and most of the subtlety, but it still has enough action for the children and wit enough for everybody. A critic for Variety said the following, The Graham Yarn has a subtle, satirical edge on its comedy, which will limit its appeal to adult audiences. And Time magazine said of it, This light-hearted, fast-moving rap has inspired some of Disney's most invented draftsmanship and satire. It's funny looking back at those reviews, seeing how many critics preferred Wind in the Willows to Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Because that's kind of the exact opposite nowadays. You look at any modern release of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, and there's a lot more emphasis on the former. Toad's a lot smaller on the theatrical posters. He isn't even on the DVD and Blu-ray covers. Also, Sleepy Hollow's been reissued more often than Willows, giving more people the opportunity to watch it. You add on the fact that Sleepy Hollow is a more well-known and iconic story, and you can see why Wind in the Willows can fall to the wayside. I think there is one other thing that overshadows the original cartoon. The ride based on it. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride is one of the most famous Disney attractions ever built. I think that's an objective fact. But while it is based on Wind in the Willows, there are some very notable plot deviations. The cartoon ends with Mr. Toad learning the error of his ways and promising to live his life without any mania, right before cycling back into a new one. The ride ends with you crashing your car and going to hell. Which one do you think is more memorable? When I first watched the cartoon, I was surprised that the ending was different from the attraction. Long story short, Mr. Toad's wild ride sticks out more and it easily overshadows the original. But does any of this make Wind in the Willows bad? Well, let's dive into it. The basic plot of the Wind in the Willows goes as follows. J. Thaddeus Toad is adventurous and wants to do everything. He's always falling into new fads and trends. Or manias, as the film puts it. They are starting to take a whole toll on his finances, much to the chagrin of his friends. But then he discovers something really new and exciting. Cars. He becomes so obsessed with them that he trades away his estate, Toad Hall for one. But when the car turns out to be stolen, it's up to Toad and his friends to set things right and get their home back. Full disclosure, I've never read the Kenneth Graham novel, so I can't really talk about it from an adaptation standpoint. From what I've gathered, it seems fairly faithful, with some small changes here and there. The climax seems to be where most of the changes happened, with the Toad Hall fight being more frequently cited. It's apparently a lot less action-packed in the book. Also, the ending is different. In the book, Toad learned his lesson, and that was it. He didn't cycle into another mania like he does in the film. Either way, for the purposes of this video, we'll be talking about it as a standalone cartoon. First of all, the animation. It's great, just as you'd expect from this era of Disney films. All of the characters are super emotive with lots of fun expressions and movement. You can pause at any second and immediately understand how the characters are feeling. But there are also a lot of great quiet and atmospheric moments, mainly in the back half of the film. I love this shot of rat and mole silhouettes in the Christmas trees. Even though it's a comedy, the quiet and somber moments are given the gravity and quietness that they need. The film balances both really well, and there's never a moment where I feel like the comedy intrudes on the drama, or the drama intrudes on the comedy. And on that note, the comedy. 
The film is straight up one of the funniest Disney's ever made. Describing comedy is always difficult since there's only so many ways you can say that was funny. But there's a lot of really good slapstick, especially near the climax. It's really fast paced and doesn't let up for a moment. And there are a lot of good one-liners and banter between the characters. It's a nice mix and doesn't rely on just one kind of joke. How did he get a motor car? The only way a gentleman gets anything. The honest way. And what is the honest way? Haha, <laughs> I thought you wouldn't know that, Governor. <laughs> I also think some of the humor just comes from the absurdity of the premise. Anthropomorphic animals weren't anything new, even back then. But having them mixed with regular humans isn't something you see very often. A horse testifying on the stand to a human judge to defend a toad is one of those things that's just so out there and weird that you can't help but laugh at it. And all of that is supported by a fun cast of characters. They're all distinctive with memorable personalities and quirks. Toad is probably the most unique Disney film protagonist of this era. Generally speaking, protagonists in early Disney films are very black and white good guys. That's not to say they were flawless, but the flaws are usually excused as naivety or circumstantial, like with a character like Pinocchio. But Toad is flawed. He's obsessive and selfish, only thinking about his own gratification over everyone else's wants and needs. And it ends up being his downfall, one that he needs to take a lesson from. I know this is basic screenwriting 101, but for early Disney films, it's very welcome. There are a bunch of fun side characters who complement his wackiness. Rat, Mole, and McBadger are great straight men, put out and tired by Toad's shenanigans, but still loyal when their friend needs help. Cyril, meanwhile, is just his buddy who'll be with him through anything, no matter how odd it is. It's a great contrast. And the Weasels are good antagonists. Watching this film, you can see why they keep popping up in Disney cartoons, even to this day. And you know, despite this being seen as the lesser half of Ichabod and Mr. Toad nowadays, Disney still continues to pay tribute to it. Again, the Weasels still make appearances, from Prince and the Popper to Roger Rabbit to the newer Mickey cartoons, and Toad himself has become kind of an icon to a lot of Disney fans. Part of that is because of the film's derivatives, mainly Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, but he still comes up a lot. As of writing, Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary is still going on, and there was a lot of Mr. Toad stuff. One of the gift shops on Main Street had a huge statue of him. There was a dessert themed after him. They even made a popcorn bucket. So, I think this film is a lot more iconic than most people give credit for. The Wind in the Willows is a wonderful film. Even though it's overshadowed by other things nowadays, it's still worth looking at. The animation's great, the humor's great, the characters are great. It showed that even with the slump the studio went through in the 40s, the artists and filmmakers still had plenty of talent left in them, paving the way for all the wonderful films they made in the following years. So if you haven't, check this film out and see what kind of mania you can get into for yourself. Have you seen this cartoon? Which one should we cover next? Well, let me know down in the comments. But. That's all the time I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching as always, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care.